welcome to season four, uh, Samurai Jack DVD. It was uh, I'm very excited that it happened. You kind of always worry from uh, season to season that it might not happen, but here we are. And so I thought for it, because this is the last one, obviously, I thought it'd be neat to get uh, more members of the crew together rather than just myself and some of the other guys and kind of talk about the genesis of Jack and how everybody uh, felt working on it, the experiences, the good and the bad. Hi, I'm Lynn Naylor, and I worked on character design on Samurai Jack. Hi. <laughs> I'm Paul Rudish, and I did various things on Samurai Jack at different points. Uh, started early with some designs, and then story, and storyboards, and whatever janitorial work needed to be done afterwards. Uh, I'm Brian Andrews, and I was a storyboard artist and writer for Samurai Jack. Uh, Getty Tartakovsky, producer director, Samurai Jack. I'm Leticia Lacey. I was a color stylist on Samurai Jack. I'm Andy Soriano. I was also a character designer and mascot of Samurai uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jack. And I'm Scott Wills. I was the co art director along with Dan Crawl, who's not here. Dan did the, painting, the drawings and I did the paintings. So uh, as we're kind of talking, we're talking how everything kind of came, came together because we started out with uh, kind of no crew. And then uh, everything kind of started to fall in place and I got very lucky with how everything happened. It's almost like fate intervened. And uh, one of the first people I picked up was Lynn. And, uh, and Lynn, you want to talk about a little bit how we got together? Or? <laughs> well, I just um, asked Guinea for a job like I always <laughs> do. <laughs> and he says, I'm, you're on the list. And... Um, when we started, it seemed like, you know, we're really moving into a development almost. So it was really cool, f cool for me because a lot of times on a series, you just jump right into production. And so it was pretty cool because Dan was doing a lot of um, ink spatters and a lot of painting and stuff. And then, and then we were trying to really find a style um, based on what Gendy wanted with his direction. And um, so we were just drawing all kinds of all kinds of characters, whatever it was, like aliens, uh, animals, uh, all kinds of creatures and stuff like that, and just doing tons of them, and it was really fun. And uh, one of the first things kind of to see if Jack would work would be to have like a normal kind of looking samurai against this crazy looking alien. And that was kind of, I think that's what we were drawing a lot of aliens at that time. And, uh, and so uh, I needed to have a, a background artist to paint the background, to do color, because I had this idea that it was going to be really, really uh, cinematic and you know different, and the color would be really expressive and unique and more artistic than some of the things we've done before. Really make it more um, stylized. And so, um, but I really didn't. You know, we were so sheltered in our world from Dexter to Parpuff that I really didn't. I really didn't know a lot of painters. So I called Bill Ray, who used to do some freelance on some other projects, and Bill was available for a little bit, and he came in and started doing some initial paintings some development, and then, um, but then he had to kind of pull out of it, and he goes, well, you know, there's this guy at DreamWorks who's kind of miserable over there, <laughs> and, uh, and he wants to get out, and his name's uh, uh, Scott Wills. Scott, I don't know if you want to... Get out. Get out. Now, by the way. Uh, where am I working now? <laughs> um, yeah, I know, so I was a little burned out on feature, and, um, and it's funny because I was starting uh, on this movie, Sinbad, and I get a call, and it, it's Gendy Tartakovsky. Is this Gendy Tartakovsky? And I give him a little pause, like I don't know who it is, you know? Because I didn't know Gendy, and I had to go like, who? <laughs> but I did. <laughs> well, the thing is, all my friends were working for Gendy. Uh, you know, uh, Chris Riccardi and Lynn and a lot of um, Ren Stimpy people were already on, I think, by that point. So I was just, I think so. I think I want to come over there. And I came and saw you and saw the work that Lynn and Dan was doing and it looked just so fun and looked like a great time so yeah and it was kind of a and, and Scott brought his portfolio in kind of to look at and there was it was really great because there was a lot of um, like really cartoony run and snippy type stuff and then all of a sudden there was this great feature development which was completely completely different and uh, like you know real real painting and not that the other stuff wasn't real painting. <laughs> big budget. Just, big budget, big budget painting, yeah. Like really, you know, feature work and stuff. And, but it still had this kind of great um, kind of stylized um, quality to it. It wasn't just realistic painting. So uh, I sweated over the weekend to, you know, if Scott was going to take the job, and then he did. And then from then, everything kind of started to really fall into place. And then, um, 
Uh, Brian, you came on. So, so Mark, my, my brother Mark, who's also a board guy and has been working at Pixar for a while, but at the time he was still down here working on various things. I don't even remember what he was working on at that time. Yeah. I, I don't know, was he doing Spider-Man? Oh, yeah, the, maybe. The live action. Yeah. He was doing some boards with Sam Raimi on Spider-Man at the time, I think. Gay needed some help because uh, I guess he didn't have enough, you didn't have enough board artist guys to get all the work done for that first right. season. So, and we had all gone to college together. So he contacted Mark, and then Mark contacted me, and because you know, and we were going to join forces and do you know the Blind Archers episode, like episode seven, seven, the first, the first one, yeah. yeah. And uh, so Mark was busy. I was already at another job, so I was busy as well. So we had to do it like on the weekend. So I think like on one Sunday or something, I went over to Mark's place, and like on the table, sitting across from each other, we just had the paper and we just started roughing it out just really fast. So I think we did the whole episode in like you know a day and a half or something, just sitting back and forth, just. Then this happens, then this happens, and then blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then we cleaned it all up, brought it in, did a double pitch or whatever. And the, I mean, we, the process is you bring in a rough version of the storyboard, and you put it up, and they pitch it to the whole crew. Right. And then, then Genny will make his notes, and uh, Genny seemed pretty happy with it. He was just like, almost no notes. I think there was like a post-it. This shot wider. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, everything else is perfect. And, you know, you, yeah, I remember you being pretty excited about it. And then, yeah, I mean, the world... Which made us very happy. Because we had no idea if it was what you wanted. <laughs> and as you guys, as you guys were doing that, were you thinking like, you know, this is completely different, or this is, you know, like, what did you think of while you were doing it? <clears throat> well, I was geeking out because it was actually gave us an opportunity to be kind of violent, which which I like because it was <coughs> swords, swords, <laughs> swords, and like real action, and plus the fact that Gindy had set up, it, you know, the, he told us like kind of what the show was kind of about cinematically, like he wanted to. Um, play with all sorts of cinematic styles, like whatever was necessary to get the mood across at that moment, like jump into different aspect ratios, all that stuff, make it epic and, and whatnot, which, you know, I was loving because I'd been working on stuff that was just very, you know, not that cool for a while and <laughs> dying to actually, you know, do stuff for real. And so this was a perfect opportunity. So we were geeking out. I mean, I had a blast, but it was like, here's a bunch of robots you get to cut in half and destroy. And then here's the samurai who's very like, straight and serious and cool, but he's being contrasted with this wacky comedy. Fishmen. I don't like fishmen. Hold on, laddie. This could get rough. Too tight. You know, I kept doing the serious stuff, and Mark was like, "No, we can put a joke here." It's like, <laughs> but then we get the mm-hmm. art designs of like, um, uh, like uh, in that episode, there's various Vikings. There's the one guy who's the jan- janitor Viking, right? Telling the story at the beginning, and and I'm looking at the guy going, "Huh? It's so cartoony." I was like, well, yeah, "I thought this was gonna be like action and hardcore." But we made it work. It was hilarious. I was able it's to look. Yeah. It's like chocolate yeah. peanut it's butter. Both. <laughs> chocolate. Right. Dude, t- great <laughs> taste. taste. And then um, as they were doing that, uh, Paul and I uh, were doing... Uh, Paul came on uh, shortly kind of after we started, and we started doing the, um, the opening movie together. Yeah, the first three half hours. Right. So if you talk about a little bit how you came on, Paul. And- um, yeah, uh, whatever was... Getting done at Powerpuff got wrapped up and I got to come up and you know, I was sneaking upstairs to check out the development that was happening already and then it was looking cool and finally got to come up there and we batted around some more design stuff a little bit but mostly we jumped onto the boards and just, I don't know, it was pretty natural. It was just really fun and you had your setup that was easy to get into and we just... We did a lot of tag team boards where we'd right. sit in the room together and, and we'd do, like Brian was talking about, where we'd do panels and then he'd do the next panel and go, what if he does this and he jumps off of this thing and then, yeah, and then he could fall down here and do that. Right. <laughs> so we did a lot of pieces like that. And then there were some other parts where you know, we'd take a section and uh, like I, I did the montage of Jack, young Jack leaving Japan and then traveling the world in the very first episode there. And so we would kind of take chunks and just kind of keep juggling, and it was just really fun. Uh, it was really easy to get into, and and yeah, again to have a, a chance to do fun action and cinematic right. stuff, and then and then when we'd come up with a stupid joke that would you know 
usually ruin a dramatic scene. <laughs> they go, ha ha, that's really funny. We can't do that. And they go, yes, you can. Yeah, we can. Yeah? Okay, well, let's <laughs> ruin the drama. Yay, here's the punchline. <laughs> Even though we took it seriously, we didn't want to take, it, take ourselves too seriously, so we still left as much humor as we can. And that's why I think there's such a variety of episodes. Some episodes steer towards the dramatic, and other episodes completely steer towards the comedy. And then, Andy, when did you come on? I, come on? I came on right at the beginning. I mean, you guys just had... Uh, you guys were working on, I think, the opening movie, but you had, um, you just had the development stuff. Not, there was no models that were locked down right away. Because I remember I came out, I think was it like Chris Savino or something, maybe showed my portfolio. Because I, I was relatively new. I was just a baby right. in the industry. Actually, me and Leticia, I think we're the, we're the, you know, we were the young ones on the production. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, this is about me. Um, no, but, so how did how did they, uh, well, you? Well, I, I I was uh, over at Nick, I think. Right, and, you were on. Right, right, right. Yeah, right. and um, and and that I did the first season of, of whatever that was. Right, uh, whatever that was, and then I saw the the conceptual stuff, and I was like, I want on this show so bad. So I went and I met with you. You saw my portfolio. That's You're right. like, yeah. Um, I remember that. You, you gave me a shot. You're like, hey, you know, take the weekend, draw draw like five characters or four or five characters or something, some aliens and different things like that. And I think I came back, and just like black and white, whatever, and, and I, uh, you know, I came back with, I was just so gung-ho and I wanted on the show so bad. And, and to work with this crew, it was, uh, I think I gave you like 26. Like, right. And I'm not joking. Like, all I think, colored, yeah, uh, rendered out. Yeah. Fully colored, uh, fully rendered. Uh, I think that was the best work I did. Um, uh, you know, that, <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah, so so we got on that show, and it was intimidating because you know here it was you know like Lynn Naylor and and Paul Rudish and 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 these people that were just so such such like pinnacle people in in the field of animation, and it was uh, it was a bit daunting yeah. and, and intimidating, but <laughs> yeah. no, no, it was. And I think I think by season four, the end of season four, I started to to really figure out how to draw Samurai Jack, and then it was over. But uh, to, to give you an idea of like, the, the caliber of people um, uh, and how intense these guys are, I mean, this is Scott Wills, and, and we all had to draw um, our initials on the, 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 caps of, <laughs> the caps of the water, and he actually wrote his entire <laughs> name <laughs> in uh, sans serif uh, font. You know, that's what a pro he is. Yeah. Right. Anyway, so that, that's my story. Did you did you find when you had just a basic crew that it was easier than because it becomes like the project all the really good people are getting on then more people want to get on did you find that or yeah I mean I guess a, little I mean, a lot bit, of people are tied up but right yeah I mean I guess it was a little bit like that but it was more I guess I don't even think about it because I'm so in in the struggle of making the show that I don't think about like oh you know everybody thinks this is a great crew and everybody's coming on I never kind of think about the outside of the project like that it's always kind of like you know okay I need this board who can do this who can do this who's available you know because right. um, then maybe in hindsight maybe yeah like what Andy was saying maybe it was some of that you know but like actually most of the people that we hired were kind of you know I mean it's people that we knew but then but yeah maybe a little bit of that and then uh, Leticia how did you how, how did I even know yeah <laughs> um I was working for John Kay at Spump Co., and I got laid off, and I asked him, where do I go to do color? And he said, Gendy Tartakovsky. So then I called you, but I didn't know that you did Dexter's Lab. And then someone told me, and then, yeah, I had to be on the show. And so, and, uh, and so what Leticia does, she does uh, color models. So after, let's say, like Lynn designs or Andy designs a, uh, a character, she will get it, and then she'll put uh, color into it. Uh, that kind of reflects in the background. And, and the job through uh, working on Dexter and Powerpuff, like, um, the people were good and they knew their color sensibilities, but, like, usually when somebody comes in, they always bring something to the table. And not that I don't want to insult other people because they did bring a lot to it. Uh, but then when Leticia started, and she, I gave her a test, because you really can't tell, like, you know, well, do you have color sense? Well, I guess that kind of matches. <laughs> I don't know. So it's kind of a, it's a really hard job to hire for because you're really hiring specifically on people's taste of color and how they distribute it and all that stuff. And hers and all her color combinations were great. So like when Scott being in the background and we put this color over it, I would, whenever I'd come into the cubicle and look at the color, I would always be really surprised. Like, wow, how did you get that? That was amazing. And, and it was neat that I never kind of experienced that before in other shows. Probably because also we were doing tamer color. We could do stuff that was more 
Yeah, I remember you having Experiment. difficulty filling that position, and it was especially difficult because there's no line around the characters. Yeah, right. yeah. So it really... It's always making yeah. something brighter or darker yeah. than the background, so... So it's very difficult to make yeah. it that work. That kind of line to save you. To, mm -hmm. yeah. So you yeah. really have to be extra careful about how the colors play against the background, and yeah, like, yeah. well, you can talk about values <laughs> and intensity and stuff, but... Yeah. It was, yeah, it was extra tricky. And it, it's a fun challenge, and it was a, such a beautiful show. You get these gorgeous paintings that are just dripping with beautiful color, and then, you know, you got these wonderful drawings that Lynn and um, Andy drew and Gindy and, and everybody, and then you put it together and, and take out the lines, and then you're like, there you go. There's your, your art for the, for the screen. First of all, we didn't even know if we could do it because it's really labor-intensive to do something like that. And also what we learned was something that I didn't even... I mean, we, we kind of knew about it because it's, you know, animation 101. Your characters have to read over the backgrounds. But because of the line, you just kind of go, ah, it reads fine, you know, because the line always separates it from the background. But then when we started doing this show, all of a sudden the characters and the backgrounds would, would kind of melt into each other. And it took us a couple of seasons to really start nailing it and doing, okay, for this show, Jack's going to be white and the backgrounds are going to be super dark. Or all the characters are going to be dark valued, and the backgrounds are going to be. You need light. to start with a plan, mm -hmm. a simple plan at the beginning, right. so they didn't have trouble later mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Also, yeah. a lot of varying color models for different characters for different mm -hmm. scenes and mm -hmm. things. You know, Jack may be all tinted green on this one because of the lighting of the backgrounds and mm -hmm. stuff. And so it wasn't just here's this color, fill them in. Right. Yeah. There were different color choices for different scenes and yeah. Lighting really, yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's actually and everything kind of stems back to kind of like uh, classic Disney's because they used to do that a lot where they would really even though the characters had outlines you really if you analyze that they really toned them down like you know uh, Alice in Wonderland Alice is white and powder blue and all the backgrounds are black basically you know and you kind of don't think about it but you go wow right that's an amazing amazing read and uh, once we kind of hooked onto that, then things kind of became easier and we can go one way or another with a direction. And like Sleeping Beauty, the backgrounds are so rich and colorful. And then you actually the characters are kind of drab in order to contrast the backgrounds. Right. And you don't even really think about it when you're watching the movie. But if you look at, you know, Briar Rose and Prince Philip, they're kind of gray, kind of olive. But it makes a nice read against those lush backgrounds. And So let's talk about um, kind of the the struggles because I think one thing that we appreciate in our own work is how difficult it is to get something of quality onto the air in the TV schedule and budget and where most of the struggles I think comes from trying to do something good in this limited amount of time rather than from something else I guess. In, um, so Scott, I don't know if you want to maybe start kind of rolling into it. What were your challenges of well, doing this show? Obviously, <laughs> obviously the biggest challenge is that every episode is in a new location. And you just don't do that in TV. You usually, uh, you have one main location you're always in, and you may have a few around that. But, but Samurai, not only was every episode a completely new uh, environment, but usually he would travel through a few in the beginning to get there, so they're all those. And so just to try to keep up in, in every episode reinventing you know, oh, we're in the desert now, we're in the jungle now, we're in a, a futuristic city. Oh, we already did this futuristic city, we did a new futuristic city. And to keep up with that show after show, it's just pretty brutal to try to and what did constantly you, invent. And did you yeah. do stuff to inspire you, or were you burnt out at any point? Um, or? I was burnt out after the fourth season. Because it, 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 sometimes you... <laughs> and, well, <laughs> always angry. Always angry. <laughs> but you, we would run into, you know, you're like, you're, you're, we've got, you know, uh, we're in a different desert. Oh, how can I do this? Yeah, I've already used this color scheme. You, you almost start running out of ideas. Um, so that, that was very difficult. And just there's just no time to experiment. So you just, have to, you just have to have these ideas so quickly. You know, I need a new idea, something I haven't done immediately. You know? Sometimes that works um, for you, though. Yeah. It, yeah, that you yeah. don't have time to second guess anything. Right. And no, so you just yeah. go, well, yeah, this is my idea today, so yeah. I'm going for it. And when it Maybe comes it back from overseas, <laughs> we'll see if it worked or not. <laughs> yeah, but, but and luckily Guinea was open to a you know things could be weird and different, so you could just try whatever, and that's that's what was so fun about it is just do whatever weird color scheme you know as long as it works for the story. Right. But um, that was very very difficult, you know. And then there's all, all, 
all the new characters in each, <laughs> you know, and lots of every oh, episode, God. all these new characters. I, I all blame new Brian couples. Andrews for yeah. the shots. Like every panel yeah. was a different crowd shot of all, yeah. the, all these of dudes thousands. doing you know, something awesome <laughs> yeah. in this panel. And then the next one, it's a different, it's like a totally different, different. angle and yeah. shot so have that you have to... Design seven just, armies, Andy. Yeah, exa- <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know what I think helped a lot, though, that kind of uh, went through the whole show was it. Samuel Jack is black, black hair and a white robe, and a coup's black, and he, he always you could always find a way to make him work, you know, because he's so stark. Right. And I think that helped a lot, you know. So. Uh, but, I I don't know. I thought yeah. it was a drag because Scott was always working so hard. I wanted to stand behind us behind him and found out all his find out all his techniques and stuff, um, because I couldn't believe he could secrets. paint like that. It just made me sick, and so <laughs> so. But, you know, you never could do that because it's always working too hard. And at one point, um, he was checking things out on computer. He always did everything by hand. He was checking stuff out on computer. And he had this, like, black curtain here yeah, that was surrounding him. <laughs> and so this guy, like, the we, all, the yeah, we all used to, like, see him in there. He was, like, so busy. And we used to go, and so we started calling him the wizard. <laughs> I don't know if he knew that or not, but we used to say, the wizard, the wizard's busy now. Leave him alone. You know. It was funny because wasn't he? He was like the only guy until like Rich, Rich Daskus, yeah. right? He helped out at the end, but then and then then it was like, oh, Scott does have a friend, like because he, because <laughs> <laughs> you then you'd hear him talking and usually berating, you know, Rich, berating. but but uh, oh, no. but uh, <laughs> it, you know, but they like, oh, okay, he does like talk and and, and oh. socialize with it because usually he is just buried in that curtain, no time just, to talk. just like no, cranking it. Work. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and Jenny Baker too was really. Oh, well, yeah. Jenny, Jenny, yeah. Jenny, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, there's a few really people. Happy. Yeah, you, yeah. you can't. Yeah. There's too much to do. We had freelancers and we had Jenny and and, uh, but it felt like to me of even the freelancers that like. You have to. What are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, you know, and you, it's all. It's just so much work, and you're trying to keep track of it all, make sure it all works. It was it's kind of overwhelming, you know. And any what struggles did you have <laughs> <laughs> on the show? What struggles didn't I have, man? Uh, I mean, I think I think the carpet from my cube to your office was was like worn thin <laughs> because it'd be like you know taking my drawing. Is this good? Go back, try it again. Is this? Is this? And then it'd be like. Uh, Andy, we uh, we haven't drawn Samurai Jack like that for uh, three seasons. And I'd be like, <laughs> is, that, uh, is that me talking? Yes, yeah, Russian. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's, yeah. that's me. Um, and it was it was really really a really difficult difficult show to design. I don't know if anyone. I don't think anyone could think it was simple, but uh, it it was hard. I mean, Lynn, Lynn, poor Lynn and Chris Riccardi used to, you know, take me to lunch or, or go to lunch with me, and where I'd be like, "Oh God, I'm gonna get fired! Oh, <laughs> oh God, why doesn't Gendy like me? Oh God!" You know, it was, it was, uh, it was a, a challenge. But I, I've never because uh, we've kind of all semi worked together before, and then yeah, you guys all went to the same school, even you know, right? Like well, the there's there's, there's like a certain sensibility that would develop in, well, we in know, our language. We know when to ignore you. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 whatever. You're, you're getting this. <laughs> okay. We're right. Yeah. And, you know, I took everything to heart. You know, I, I, was, yeah. I was so wide-eyed and, and just, it, it, it was a great learning experience and cut my teeth on. But, yeah, it was, I didn't have the vocabulary, you know, vocabulary yet or still but, um, to, to, to do it. But it was, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a good process. But. Uh, like one thing that I, I think you're, to me, one of your, the best work you've done was the, the Haunted House episode. I think, uh, I mean, you were good at casting people for, for their, their strengths. You know, it's like, you know, I got the zombie shows or, or monster stuff and a lot of robots and, and, and things like that. But Gibby would have to show me how to hold a sword. He had a sword in his office. I don't know. It, what? Was it, could right? it have I mean, killed somebody? Straight. But, you know, because the overhand thing and the... I was not into, like, fighting with swords. Like, I, it's like... Oh well, I'll go get my nails done. Whatever you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, I was like, that's a great point because it was yeah, something really important to me for the show. That uh, when Jack held the sword, we try to right. do it he as right as possible, rather than just kind of a cartoony yeah. way of holding it. And yeah. so not everybody had that language. And right. I mean, Brian had all but the then, martial arts. Of course, that's where Brian comes in. Right. Yeah. 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 But you know, stuff would still that. slip through the cracks, which would drive me nuts. You see, Noel drawing. He's like, he's got the samurai sword. He's holding Sorry. it. He's choking it way up by the thing, as opposed to like you know, one hand near the bottom, one hand near the hilt. It's just like. 
Oi. Yeah, what's this cartoon Oi. butter knife? Golly. Yeah, I know. It drives me nuts. But... Samurai sword should be three hands <laughs> long. <laughs> ah. Really, it's kind of a, a key thing is through, you know, four seasons, which is almost, you know, three, three, three and a half years, how do you keep going? Right. You know, on that kind of pace and schedule, how do you, you know, like you just finish a board and here's another board. Right, right, right. You know, it's and it's... It's relentless. It is. It's really relentless. And then it's, it's, it's very, it's very difficult. And... Um, did you say, did you have, you know, like color after color, did you at a certain point go, okay, you know, what color do we do now? <laughs> well, yeah, there was that, but I was also thinking just now that, um, you know, it takes so long to show every single color model. Sometimes these BGs would take so long just to open up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew I had to get it shown to you by the time before you started opening my desk drawers. <laughs> that's, that's when you got completely bored and you'd start rummaging right. through. <laughs> so I had, I had that amount of time. That's a great thing about TV versus feature is that there's always something coming back. There's always something happening. You yeah. see your work. You right. know, you're not working on one thing for three or four years. It's just, right. it's, you know, it's great. What, what's, what's coming in this week, you know? Right, I think that's what the, that's always like the, the schedule, the way it goes is you start real strong, everybody's excited, you get going, mm -hmm. then you're kind of going and then you're kind of going in the blind. You're like, well, I think it's kind of working, but I'm not really sure. Yeah. And the first work print comes back and then it's usually, it's rejuvenation or it's, or it's complete and misery. anger and misery and depression. <laughs> yeah. And well, then uh, luckily for us, it was the overseas did an amazing job and, um, and the first episode came back and I remember being like, Wow, there's there's something here, right, yeah. you know, and it was and it was great, and, and I remember, and the first episode was so silent too, because we had that whole um, that whole flashback sequence that you all did, the montage, yeah, and all that stuff. Yeah. And I remember the dialogue. We, it came back, and then uh, Mike Lazo and Linda Siminski, who were the executives at the time, um, they were in town, and so you know, I go, well, the first episode came back, let's go look at it, and they go in, and then you're sitting in this little editing office. And they're watching it, and it's complete silence. And it's not like it's funny, right. you know, because it's dramatic stuff happening. But there's no music, and there's barely any dialogue. And they're s sitting there watching it, and I'm like going, like, "Wow, this is really great. There's some amazing stuff." <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I they're looking, and I'm looking at them, and they don't have any expression on their faces. And I go, "Wow!" And I start sweating because <laughs> I go, "That's it. You know, they're gonna they're gonna cut it off production, and it's not working. Where's the dialogue? Where's more exposition and stuff?" And then. But after they were like, you know, Laz was like, wow, it's incredible and, you know, blah, blah, that's blah. A, that's another thing I think is awesome about it because it's like, you know, so many animated shows on TV are so talk heavy. So like right. Jack took the opportunity to like, in the, you know, to, to <laughs> take the time to be quiet, right? You know, tell the story in a slightly different manner. Like it doesn't have to be wall to wall dialogue. And at the time, and it's even gotten worse since Jack, amazingly enough. So many shows on all the, all the variety of networks, they think it's all about you know, non-stop yapping. And like that, the only way to tell a story is to have characters talking at each other like, it's like exposition all the freaking time. Yeah, it's like show. nothing yeah. but just spewing exposition. Like no one takes the time for even two seconds and like, you know, certain writers who get involved that maybe have no animation experience or whatever who... Or don't like animation. Who, who don't actually have a bias against yeah. animation but now they have a job in animation yeah. and they just, you know, write it at a, you know... Just slumming it? Slumming yeah, exactly. It. And they just write it, write it heavy. Everything's going so writer heavy and it's like you you miss a little something. There's more than one way to tell a story. And the beautiful thing about Jack was it was like, here's a bunch of people who were truly trained in their craft, let loose. And we were like, free to do stuff. How do you approach telling a story visually? Visually. Without relying on dialogue? You know, how do you think about it differently? Well, I, well, I don't know how I think about it differently because that's how I think. Right. You know what I mean? Like I don't think about I don't think about a story as like being like you know I gotta have the characters yapping nonstop you know what I right. mean I kind of like it's a visual medium it's visual storytelling and my mind's always been towards you know the cinema aspect I mean you gotta you have a camera to shoot it it's not a radio play right so visual for me always comes first you know it's just like where am I gonna put the shot and then you could start and then the story also is wrapped around like well, what are characters saying to one another what needs to come across and now it starts mm -hmm. becoming symbiotic a little bit. But just not over Zeus. <laughs> but then not but, but not being over, you know, you know, not not putting so much emphasis on the one at the expense of the other. They should reinforce each other, right? So for me and my my uh, team partner at the time, you know, Brian Larson, right. who's amazing. Uh, you know, we'd sit there and just riff on the ideas for a while. It's like you first you got to beat board outline like what's going to happen before people you start figuring out what people are going to say, and then the <laughs> idea of some dialogue might appear 
out of that process, you know. But then it's like the thought process is like, well, how am I going to show that? You know, it's like it's going to be a long shot, close up. What does that mean for the story? What does that mean for the character? It's like, all those things start coming factoring in. Like you're talking about the symbiosis of words and pictures. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, well, this is the dialogue here, but a composition like this symbolically reflects what's right. being said here. So you know? therefore, this guy is small, and this guy is berating that guy. Right. So I'm going to shoot it up so that he's he's large and he's tiny. Small, right. To reinforce just reinforces the ideas. And, uh, and for you, coming from you know Dexter and Parpuff, where we did do a lot more dialogue-driven stuff, was it a hard shift? Um. No, again, kind of like what Brian was saying, we all started drawing pictures, and so drawing is the first language we have in our brains, and so, um, no, it really wasn't that hard, but, uh, you know, that was coming out of comedy, so, you know, it kind of asks for more funny funny jokes and sayings. But if you're trying to do something that's like, you know, drama or build a mood or it's spooky, Mm -hmm. You know, having people yap nonstop through it kind of, it could possibly kill the mood, you know, right. unless also, you design it that way specifically. You also, it kind of naturally was set up that way being Jack's character. Right. He's right. a quiet guy. guy. He's a loner and he's trapped in this crazy world. And so he's automatically the straight man and he's easy to do, you know, the drama and stuff with. And then the world, all the insular characters are the craziness yeah. that he has to face. And so you can come at him with all the crazy you know, characters and dialogue and stuff and just have him respond or, you know, choke back things that he might want to say. And, right. and uh, I think it just kind of naturally wants to work that way. You know, he's, he doesn't have... It's not like the Thundercats where they need to talk to each other and get their plan together. <laughs> Jack travels alone, so right, he doesn't right. need to say anything. He, he knows what he's going to do. Right. And then did you, have a, did you have, like, a struggle that you remember that was frustration or... Um, that you struggled with during boards or designs or just getting things in on time <laughs> just wanting to <laughs> wanting to draw it prettier right. but, uh, well I mean we started we usually had a, a pair of storyboard guys that would work right. together and Charlie Bean and I were paired up for most of our storyboarding time and uh, who couldn't be here today because he's rocking it in Paris, directing <laughs> some shows over there. But, yeah, at one point when Charlie got the cactus needle in his hand, oh, that yeah. sucked. Yeah, 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 he fell in the cactus. Right, that's right. right. And he, like, got, like, a five-inch cactus needle pierced into his knuckle and into the bone of his hand. <laughs> yeah. And so he was, yeah, he was out of commission for a while, and I had to do a couple boards on my own. So kind of, like, a, I know there's some stories behind some of these episodes that it was really challenging, and Lynn about the Jack and the Rave oh, yeah. episode. That was amazing. In that particular show, like, there was, you know, we didn't duplicate any character. All of them were different. All of the Rave um, kids and stuff, they all had a different look. Um, and there were, there were a lot of them. And so we, it was really challenging and it, it took a lot of work because you just didn't want to repeat yourself. We were also looking at like at all kinds of stuff like um, um, dance sequences and stuff right. like that, you know, in, in order to work out something where they could be animated in such a way that it would work, you know, because they're all dancing and stuff. And uh, Kenny brought in dancers. <laughs> yeah, he brought in dancers. <laughs> no, he didn't. I wanted to. <laughs> right, but like, but if you were doing a feature with that, we'd definitely bring in like a real choreographer and have. You yeah, know, and and the, fly the thing girls. is with all, with all of the shows. It was the same thing. It was always a challenge, and and, it, and you didn't get that feature thing. But I think it's better because a lot of times on features, they take so long deliberating, you lose all the energy. And sometimes when uh, when you're doing so many shows, I don't have ideas for all of them, and it's just kind of like, okay, well, here's this show. I need to see it next week. you know. And that's kind of the direction that I get. And so Leticia was doing the, the Chicken Jack episode. And there was like a thousand crowd scenes in that one. Yeah, I think there was like 200 Craig Kelman alien people. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and I go, well, you know, everything, it's got to read. You know, I want the characters to shine, but, you know, it still has to read. And crowd scenes are really difficult to do because, especially when they're all drawn in detail. And, uh, and so then I walked into Leticia's room 
and she did this like three color system where she used three colors in all the crowds, but she just kind of bounced it throughout. And I was so taken back by it and so impressed. <laughs> it was such a, such a simple thing, but I was, I was just, I was so excited because it's such an easy and great looking solution to such a, you know, I was just, it was just going to be a nightmare. So I don't know if you want to talk about how. Oh yeah, I think I was just pressed for time and was like, okay, this will work here and here and here. <laughs> and I, I went through that way because, you know, they're all from the same world, so that worked, you know. But I think other episodes where they're going through different worlds, you know, you have to keep the same scheme for, you know, this group of villagers and then, you know, but this was all the, the chicken, chicken jack people. And so you just came up with it, just like, I need to save time, so... Yeah, it was a save time thing, but, I, you know, different backgrounds, I was like, I can go darker on this sort of scheme here inside the ring, but then, you know, it was still similar, but I just made it some darker, some lighter, and kind of kept it. <laughs> the story style that we did was always real simple idea, and then just milk it. Milk it, yeah. <laughs> you know, to do it, to make it feel juicy. And well, we had more complicated stories like Birth of Evil and stuff like sure. that. But my favorite, all, it always seems that my favorite episodes are like, you know, Jack goes to the cemetery. And there's a big fight versus zombie. Jack's got to fight some zombies. <laughs> And it's just kind of really appealing just to, fun. to. I mean, we built, you know, we built. Yeah, we built the whole we thing built with stuff the stealing up to of the sword yeah. and all that kind of whatnot. So I wanted to do this kind of film noir one. Yeah. Lulu, sweet thing, I miss her. I hate the rain. It makes me all sentimental. And then I wrote up all the dialogue for it. Yeah. So you basically story. just that was one of the rare times where since it was specifically totally. Your idea, and you had a total vision. You wrote it all out. You know, just here's all the here's the little bits of dialogue, and very like minimalistic Frank Miller style. It was just like narrated noir style, right? Like, just blah blah blah, just a few things, right? Gave that to me, so basically, it's like, oh, all right. And then all I needed was the design. It's like, well, roughly the robot might look like this, and he's got the dog Lulu. It looks like this, and here's the joke. I'm like, but the way he'd written it, it's like all the jokes were like were like there. So I knew how to visually tell it just by the word. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, he's like the one where the, the dog gets kidnapped and the whole thing. And right. like, who's got him? And it's like, holds the dog up to the phone. And it's, <laughs> it's not like you said he holds him up to the phone. It's just like, I yeah, have yeah. kidnapped him. And his voice comes over the phone. I'm like, ah. And immediately I have the image. It's, it's so ridiculous. Right. Giant Aku. The little, little dog. Your fingers. Yeah. Tiny little cutie dog. <laughs> but that was, a, that was a good example of like, here, you laid it out. Basically, words. And then I can just jump in there and just mess with the visuals. And then you had a couple shot ideas. Right. And then I just grabbed those okay. and inserted them where we needed them. After I finished um, working on Powerpuff Girls, I wanted to do something different. And I decided that, you know, I want to go kind of full-on action and see what we could do in action. And so it's kind of funny to me because as a, you know, one of my, some of my favorite shows when I was growing up was, you know, Thunder the Barbarian and, you know, uh, the, the myth of Conan and stuff. And so I decided, well, what can I do with a kind of a sword-wielding guy? And I go, oh, I love, I love samurais. And this really hasn't been out there that much. So I go, okay, well, samurai. Well, I can't cut people. You know, so what am I going to do with a samurai who doesn't use a sword? And so I decided, I go, oh, what if he cut robots and stuff? We can do that. And oil can be blood and all that kind of stuff. And that really was the initial core idea of the concept. <laughs> And then, uh, then I started to just build a mythology out of it. And I knew I wanted it to be super simple. And after doing Dexter and Parpa, I was burnt out on dialogue. So that's where that kind of influence came from, not having a lot of dialogue. So I wanted to do something that was less reliant on the spoken wor word and more on visuals, visual storytelling. So that's kind of how that angle came into it. And again, coming from Dexter and Parpa, I was burnt out on the black line. And so I just wanted to do something different. So with digital... Uh, digital coloring of cartoons getting more in the mainstream, I thought, well, let's give it a shot and see if it can... It's actually practical. If it's at actually... This point. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't... Can, didn't have to hand do it. Like, right, there was no way they could do it by hand. But with digital line, it wasn't... I mean, it's still difficult, but not as difficult 
still doable. And, uh, and then seeing if we could actually get the animation to be good with all the fight scenes. So that was another one. And then, you know, um, I got the really some great directors in Korea involved with it because that's, you know, you're really nothing without your directors overseas. And the same guy, this guy Jim Jong, who worked with me on Dexter and stuff, uh, he was available and then he came on. And this other guy, director Ko, uh, and they both came on and they, you know, it's really an amazing feat of, of uh, just how much work and uh, how much work they do on it. And what I did was I wanted it to not just be an overseas studio. I said, look, if you guys really commit to this show and you make it good, then I'll put your names in the front. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they did, and then we gave them front credit. And then when we won awards, they won awards. Right. So it was, and they made them feel like they were part of it, not just mm -hmm. uh, kind of no contracting. One had really Am I correct? No one had really done that before. Not, not to that extent, to no. That extent. But also, they just, they liked it. Yeah, and, and they, they were, did and, like it, know, yeah. It was just really great that Jim could, like, get involved yeah. and really try to, you know, inject his own personal stuff into it and, and feel like he had an opportunity to do that. Usually it's just, yeah. you know, get it done, get it done, get it done. But he actually cared. <laughs> and that was, yeah, that's did, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and that's he could really actually cool. put in extra effort and... and Gave us a lot of beautiful animation just yeah. because he's an excellent animator right. himself. Did he do that one in Mondobot where he runs and gets? That was Director Co. That was Co. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, like Jim did the stuff with uh, Aku, um, Jack's father on the horse. Oh right, yeah, fighting, fighting the, the octopus things yeah. coming in from Aku. And there's yeah. an incredible, that was awesome. incredible scene. Uh, and Paul, when I was starting to develop it, uh, I usually sound stuff off of you. Do you remember? conversations that we had or um like pretty much you had you kind of just had that pitch booklet i think like you, you weren't you didn't talk about it too much you just kind of had your three pages of well this is kind of what i'm thinking about and then i read that and i was like okay there's the good guy and he wears white <laughs> that's good there's the bad guy he wears black this is great yeah okay <laughs> it's real easy i like that right and then okay the world is pretty much everything we like mixed in one pot I'm like, okay, that's yeah. really great. That's right. like the Star Wars formula. <laughs> you take your sword and sorcery and your science fiction and, and your, you know, I like swords and I like jets and I like everything and I like robots and, <laughs> and dragons and right. just stir it all up. And it's like, so, well, this is perfect. It's fodder you know, for everything. You can, anything goes in this world and the basics are so, you know, the, the conflict is so iconic and basic, right. but then you can color it with any kind of, subject matter or you know taste as far as right. comedy or drama or anything and so it's like this is a perfect playground you've set it up bold and simple but with plenty of room for lots of fun to happen mm -hmm. so and that was kind of the thing also is is you know doing when i was trying to think of action ideas it all sounded cliche you know like oh it could be you know Dogs underwater or cats in space or what? like, really? well, you know, you're like, you don't know. Like it's, it's been, yeah, I mean, there was oh stuff God. that it's just, it's just been done. Action's been done so much. And when you're doing science fiction too, it's all kind of just cliche. It's either Star Wars or Star Trek or, you know, or Conan or something like that. And so I was really struggling with that. And then I thought, well, I'll just do what I like. And I like samurais. And I like robots. And if they fight. More cool. power to me. Right. Yeah, so, but then the other challenge of it is, well, how am I going to sell this simple idea? The, an idea was basically black versus white over red. You know, it was, <laughs> it was completely, very arty yeah, idea. very arty idea, right? And so, so I had all these ideas. I jotted down my notes and, you know, this kind of, you know, uh, uh, son's journey to save his people back in time and stuff. And then uh, I had dinner with Mike Lazza, who was kind of the uh, executive in charge back at the time. And, uh, and I pitched an idea over, over dinner. I said, you know, not a lot of dialogue, great visuals, a lot of music and effects driving it, and, you know, single character, kind of steely, Clint Eastwood type, and uh, just visually going to be crazy and, um, you know, and this kind of simple mythology. And he goes, that sounds great. <laughs> and, uh, and it was really like, you know, I think to this day we always kind of talk about it. You know, I don't think in today's market, I would be able to sell it. And 
And plus, I had the relationship with them doing Dexters right. and Powerpuff and stuff. That yeah, the track record. The track record, they yeah. Were and they really, you know, they really believed in people, and that was that was kind of great. And so I was left to do it. You know, and it was crazy, and you know, it kind of started and ended before I even had a chance to realize we were doing something. You know, you never, <laughs> you never kind of got a chance to analyze it. And then looking back, I probably would have liked to build up the mythology a little stronger, and oh, okay. you know, all these things. You look back and you go, oh, this could have been better, or this could have been better. But right. you know, oh, that's kind of how I, you know, I kind of felt about it. And then, so like inspirations, uh, you know, I mean, Frank Miller was a huge inspiration because I love his kind of style of storytelling, and also. Um, Lone Wolf and Cub, the comic books, yeah. you know. And I think once I started reading that, I mean, I was always a samurai fan, but once I started reading that, I really started to get into it and feel even more of a mythos coming out. And kind of beyond, uh, you know, Kurosawa films, who obviously that was an inspiration too. Yeah. But in these, in these Lone, Wolf and the Lone Wolf and Cub comics, it really, um, there was a certain um, kind of darkness and, and empathy towards... The whole there's a lot of like warrior spirit stuff and honor code and I really loved all that stuff and and it was all black and white and uh, even some of the backgrounds we were really inspired by and when we did that samurai versus samurai we were talking about doing more of like an abstracted type wash right mm. yeah very uncomfortable inky yeah yeah, yeah. Awesome. and Scott painted like a it, was, it looked like it was painted rain yeah yeah that's we we're always uh, there was new color schemes we we're always trying to do but then we would try to experiment with new techniques which is always a danger because it has to go overseas and then they have to be able to do it. Right. That was a nice surprise because I'm like, oh, how are they going to paint this overseas, you know? And it came back and looked really great. And it was a technique they could actually do. It was right. all wet, so it really looked like rain was bleeding through it. It's really nice. And then just we in the compositions we did like you know a little bit of negative space and everything else is just kind of washy and rainy and then Jack starts coming over the hill as a silhouette yeah and it was really like uh, you know it was really I like I always loved the way that feels you know and then do you guys remember how you felt when you saw the first work print come back what was the first work print? the no, episode one episode one for real was it. it? I, oh, I wasn't yeah. there. <laughs> you were there. I was like, you were doing freelance. freelance, right? You were supposed to freelance. So, like, when I finally got in-house for the second season, the first one I saw was the Blind Archer the one. The Blind Archer one, okay. Which was awesome. Yeah. How, did you, feel, now, how did you feel, Paul? How did you feel, Paul? How did you feel, Paul? I don't know. Uh, I, I was excited. It was really um, rewarding to, you know, see it come back so close to to what I had imagined and what I had thought you had imagined. and. Right. Mm-hmm. And I just personally was really blown away by the quality that came back, and and uh, it really looked like our work. Everyone, you know, all our colors and all our models, and and you d- I didn't see that degeneration that you often get in a lot of TV production, right. and it was just just really top notch, and and I really went, wow, I'm proud of my job. I'm proud of my work. Wow, yeah. this is something to really be proud of. And I remember when, everyone, the first, when yeah. I first came back and, and seeing it with all this, like seeing the direction, because all the stuff you do after and post, oh, and post yeah. all the sound effects and the music and all that beginning stuff in episode one with a coup, and I was totally blown away by that stuff because it was so, it really had such a strong point of view. It was strong, you know, it wasn't wishy washy television crap. It was, you know, <laughs> it had, it had, it had a, it had a, it, it had a we keep saying it had yeah. a feature quality. You know, so I've seen that. I just couldn't believe it, you know, how strong it was, you know. And so, uh, and then I remember, uh, so, th- you know, we were, we were all, you know, proud of what we were doing and stuff. And then, you know, we get nominated for awards for Emmys and Annies and stuff. And then, but, you know, uh, through Dexter and Parpa, we were also nominated. So it was like my 13th nomination or something like that. And it was kind of like, I kind of gave up on the Emmys. It was like, you know, whatever. And it's cool. It's not a big deal. It's nice to be nominated. Susan and, Lucci of animation. Yeah, it was like, it was, it was fine. You know, it was not, you know, it, I never did this stuff for awards, you know. And then one year we went and it was for the Birth of Evil episode. And that was the one that I was the most proud of. Like, I think everybody just did an amazing job and I was so happy with it. And, and it's rare, really, that I could really say that about a lot of stuff. Like, a lot of stuff, I think we did a good job, but there's, it's a rare where I think, like, wow, we really, 
we nailed it on that one. And that one, you know, I was just like, this is the type of show that I want to watch for myself personally. So I remember we were sitting at the Emmys, and then, and then usually like your heart race, races before you go, maybe there's a chance. And then, and then you never win, and you're like, oh, yeah, right, right. okay. And then, uh, and this year was, that year was the same thing. I'm sitting there, and they go, you know, the nominees are, and then my heart doesn't even start racing. You know, I just know, like, eh, you know, <laughs> it's Simpsons, and it's fine, you know. <laughs> and then, uh, and all of a sudden, they go Samurai Jack, you know. And then we all went, like, what? And then, uh, oh. and then the Simpsons people went, what? <laughs> <laughs> And then, uh, you know, and then, and then it was just great. And what was the best thing about it was we won for something that we were so proud of. It wasn't just an episode and right. stuff. It was stuff that we all worked so hard on and, and just we believed in that episode. It just felt really good and I think everybody's really happy. And I know like Robert Alvarez, <laughs> who was one of our timers and he's been around for a while. He was so happy and, and so proud and it was nice. It was more, almost more nice for those guys. I mean, it was nice for myself too, obviously, but... It was great, and then you know, like Scott and Brian got recognized individually yeah. uh, before for their work. So it was it was very critically acclaimed, you know, and it was um, it was great. When we started writing the last episodes, we started we needed to make a decision if we're going to end the series, or if we're going to just kind of not end it and hopefully sometime down the line finish it. Was that because we didn't know if we were going to do a fifth season, right. or if we were going to just go straight to a movie? Yeah, and then also Star Wars started looming right. at that time too, so we knew we couldn't commit. At the time, to think of an ending and to do it right was too daunting for me. I couldn't handle it mentally or physically. So I decided, you know, that we're going to do it later. And just, we'll just won't, we won't end the season in a spectacular fashion, you know. So, uh, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what would be the fate of Jack, whether it was going to end or get canceled or, you know, I knew they weren't ordering more episodes, not that even that I wanted more episodes at the time. Because I was just burned out so much, and you know, I had a baby too, and uh, and it was just like I needed to stop for a second. Um, but then, and then the whole Star Wars thing was feeling like it was around the corner right. too, and so um, so we decided not to do it and just kind of finish it uh, the way we had, were going, not to do something spectacular or, or to do it in a movie. So nowadays, actually, it's funny because there's been rumblings of doing something to finish Jack. You know, and we've been talking about it, and uh, you know, I think we're all into kind of doing it and finishing the story. Well, yeah, at some point it'd be nice, uh, and maybe even do it as a feature for theatrical. You know, I think it would be great. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of on the horizon. Hopefully, you know, it's not anything definite, but it's definitely been in the talks, as they say. You know, um, but yeah, it's kind of like kind of to finish it off. I just want to say, you know. Thanks to the people who watch the show and who buy the DVDs. Uh, you know, it's the support of the people and the fans and whatever that kind of keep us going. Um, and that, you know, that I was really fortunate at the time to get all these people to work on it. I was just really lucky. So uh, thanks to you guys. Thank you, dude. Love, love, love. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I know, like, we're all, I know we always plan to always work together again, you know, whenever, uh, whenever those, the paths of the moons and the planets align light. Mm like it did back then, uh, we'll, we'll do it. I don't know if you guys didn't have anything else to add. Or? Thanks for the job, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for the cool Fine. show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.